Hello. Good afternoon. This is our guest speaker. Oh, right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope so. You go I love I say. love I love all his work. You go. He's got lots of work. Dealing with policy and the Roma and So then, it was, what were you guys publishing? It was stuff. Uh, so it was stuff. It was like banned books. Yes. And what else? And uh, and uh, and uh, teaching about forbidden subjects. All right. Okay. And then, so I can talk about that. I, I feel like that's a pretty good. Like overview, you can go in more depth of like how you did it, what was happening, and then you can talk about, say, like, this, uh, he was elected in 1990 and was mayor for 20 years. Um, it was five times to be elected, it never happened in Hungarian history, and it really has happened. Alright, and they talked about when the Bolshevik kind of revolution, and then they restarted Stalin. Um, so they understand like what it trans you know transforms into the totalitarian mm -hmm. police state. Yes. So they, they they should understand right that it's like the act of resisting against a, a government like this um, yeah. is a substantial yeah. risk. Yeah. yeah. There was some risk. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I yeah. will explain that that in what way it, it was functioning. So yeah. It was a risk, but on the other hand, for us it was better it if it was worse. Mm. That means that if they have beaten me and they arrested me, and yeah. they, I became world famous. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was very easy to run for mayorship. Yeah. Because ninety-eight percent of the country has, not, has recognized my name. Right, right. And others, they, they have spent billions of foreign right. simply for name recognition. Right. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well thank you so much for being here today. Bardemski, our grandma's cousin, um, he led a publishing and educational team in the late 1900s that uh, released banned books and um, educated on banned topics in Hungary. He was five times re-elected for the mayor of Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, and um, he, during his time there, he did a lot of work with the um, poor and Roma people in Hungary, and he continues to work on that today. So, Gavor Dembski. Yeah. It's a great honor for me to be with you and to say something about the old times, about the 80s, when I was an underground publisher. That means that I published those books and journals which were banned. So we risked a lot with that, but we achieved a lot as well. And uh, at the end of the 80s, I was invited to the United States with a scholarship. And then I, have in, I was in New York, and every day I, I have seen Ed Koch. Maybe you don't remember his name. He was the mayor of, of uh, New York for at least for eight years or 10, I don't know. And uh, I have seen every day him in television, in Channel One, that uh, he went somewhere. And his technique was to communicate that he has no time to communicate. Because he's a man of deeds. He has to arrange something to solve a problem. So the, the cameraman and the reporter was running after him. He was going somewhere. And they had to be very fast to follow him. And then he answered everything in 20 seconds. So I learned from him, if you want to be a successful politician, you have to be a man of deeds, and you have to learn how to be short. <laughs> that how to answer extremely complicated questions in 20, 30 seconds, you have a possibility to say one sentence about the situation. A second sentence, how you will solve it. The third, what is the final result? And that's it. And then to say thank you. <laughs> so it's a, it is a technique, but it was extremely successful. I used it. 
not in the same way, but I start. I tried to speak about complicated problems in a very, very simple way. Because I have known that on the other side, people who are sitting there and watching television, they don't know anything about health matters and about education and, uh, and uh, culture and infrastructure. They do not know even the word infrastructure. So I, I had to speak in that term that roads and, and bridges and, and canalization and so on. And, uh, uh, so, first, as a man of deeds, I started, as I told, my activity in a so-called planned economy, in the communist or socialist system, these are synonyms, or Soviet system. Uh, uh, this system started in 1917 in, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, it practically with a coup. It was not a revolution, but a little group of Bolsheviks from the Communist Party, they catch the power and they introduce the new totalitarian system. The terminology was created by Hannah Arendt and he was writing about two totalitarian systems, fascism, Germany, Italy, and communism. Practically the model was Russia and later on the Soviet Union. And uh, we use this terminology always Comparing the two, there were huge differences, but a lot of similarities between the two. I would like to say a few words about, because I know that you are studying this period, about the Soviet system. So what, what are the main features of the Soviet system? First of all, there was no private property, practically. Except, let's say, apartments. Very, very small parcels of land. But otherwise, everything was in the hand, owned by the state. There was no market, no market system. So in a planned economy, the main feature is scarcity. There is a, the best Hungarian economist wrote a book like that, and he almost got, he was a nominee, and I think he should have got a Nobel Prize, because with the, with the terminology of scarcity, he described the system. That the, that's the system, communism is the system of scarcity. And why? Because uh, there is a lack of market system. Because it is a lack of goods. Because it is lack of services, proper services. Lack of manpower, always. L lack of energy supplies. Why? Because, you know, in, in imagine that there is a country of 10 million people and there is a centrally planned economy. Then different ministeriums, culture, education, so they have to decide what we shall produce and how to satisfy the needs. But is it possible to plan it for five years, the, the, that what kind of needs the people have? It's impossible. And there was always a shortage of everything. And this economy could not compete with uh, capitalism where the market is regulating the prices and also the production. And there only bureau, office, uh, bureaucrats were deciding about that. Later, in, at, in the end of the 60s and later on in different countries, there were certain reforms when, when they try to introduce certain uh, elements of market capitalism into the system. The, the essence of the reform was always there, but it didn't succeed. So, uh, but what else? Naturally, there was a lack of freedom of press. So, nobody could articulate opinion publicly, and not, of, or not even privately. So, for instance, in Hungary in 1956, there was the revolution and the freedom fight against Russia. So the Hungarian young people like you, they were fighting on the streets of Budapest with, uh, with rifles and with machine guns against tanks, Russian tanks, and they were successful for 10 days. But then a second invasion of, the, of Russia came with the agreement of China and Tito and everybody in the communist world, and practically within a very short 
period of time, they suppress the revolution. But about that revolution, when uh, thousands of people were imprisoned, 200,000 people emigrated, many uh, they came here to the United States, it was practically forbidden to talk about it. Or if people are, were speaking about it publicly, it was named as a counter-revolution, an imperialistic counter-revolution. So every, they blamed the people that they were fighting, you know, and they were killing Soviet soldiers. But practically it went for civil liberties, for, for independence of the country, and uh, for all, all the features what I would describe as liberal democracy at that time. But for instance, in my family, uh, my father was participating in the revolution in a way we were in Berlin, he was a diplomat and he, uh, they uh, established a certain committee, workers council in the embassy and because of that he was dropped, dismissed and was unemployed for a while. But they never, they were at home, they were never speaking about it, never. And also, only my grandmother told, because they were not in Budapest, what happened in the streets of Budapest, but in a very silent way. And even I did not know that one of my cousins, not from this family, but from the other side, from the mother side, uh, he was killed, and the son was, uh, his son was also uh, injured in the main square of Budapest in front of the parliament, where uh, they, they killed hundreds of people with machine guns. But to, to talk about that was absolutely impossible. So it was, it was a taboo in the society. And why we established this free press around 1979? First of all, because there was, at that time already, there were a lot of manuscripts, typewritten, which were circulated in schools and universities. But the technique was very ineffective because with a, with a typewriter you can, let's say, you can make 10 copies. And, and when I visited a library when I was studying at that time, uh, I have seen that students are sitting near each other and they are giving the, 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 the pages to each other and they were reading the same, let's say, George Orwell or anything else, but was forbidden. So there was a typewritten Samizdat and we invented that we can print the samizda. That was the difference. That printed samizda means that we printed books, journals, and, and so forth, and in a huge quantity. So we printed, let's say, George Orwell. Uh, I, uh, I published four books of him in 2,000, 5,000 copies. Uh, we printed many Hungarian writers, uh, also some of them in 10,000 copies. And 1,000 copies was one ton. So imagine that you are in underground. You have to hide. First you have to print it, then you have to distribute it. And for that you need cars. And into one car uh, you can put not more than one ton. So technically it is very difficult and the police was always after us. And now maybe I will say a few words about what was missing yet, uh, what sc about scarcity that, uh, yeah. So naturally, uh, there were no basic individual rights, liberties, uh, lack of opposition parties. It was a one-party system. There was a communist party, and they won the election with 95%. You know, but if only one party is running, for the parliament, then it's natural that they, they always win. So practically, a one teacher of us, when I was uh, a student of law, explained how this power system works. On one day, the political bureau, so the center of the, the head of the communist party, they have 11 members, they decide, let's say that we make a healthcare reform or anything, or before we this and that. Next day, the government has a meeting and makes the same decision, practically. But more in details and more uh, describing it uh, with laws. 
And the third day, the parliament has a session. And the parliament accepts the law. So that's, that's the way. That's how the machinery uh, of power in that system works. It's very dull, very stupid. There are no new ideas. There is very, uh, everything is very uniformized, very uh, looks uh, the same. So then, uh, when I have seen this, that there is such a huge market for this semester, that there are so many people want to read it. And so many people bought these, uh, these, uh, these manuscripts. They were typewritten, and naturally, we had to pay to the typewriter. Then I thought, OK, I will publish. I learned in Poland. In Poland, there was the Solidarność movement. It was the first successful revolution, practically, in East Central Europe. In 1980, Lech Valenza, in the Lenin shipyard in Dansk, he started a strike because someone was dismissed, Anna Valentinovich, from the factory. And they, within a couple of days, whole Poland was in strike. So from one place to another, more and more, more, more factories stopped working. So they were on strike. And then it was interesting what happened that a friend of mine, whom I had known, he went in with an offset machine. Offset machine is, a, is a already a good technique. With that, you can produce a lot of copies, and he copied the 21 points that were the demands of the workers. Uh, there were a lot of political demands and others, higher wages and so on, and many things they demanded. And he produced 200,000 copies of it. And with that, they changed everything, because it was distributed in the country, and everybody has known what are the demands. And they also agreed about something that was very important, that individually, the different factories, the so-called strike committees, because naturally they elected committees which were leading the strike, they cannot, they are not authorized to negotiate with the government. That only Lech Valenza and his team is authorized to deal with uh, to negotiate about the points. And finally, Jagielski, the deputy prime minister of, of uh, Poland at that time, visited the shipyard. It is interesting, yes, that not they are going to Warsaw and to, uh, but the, prime, the deputy prime minister is coming there and uh, negotiating. And they told that if we don't agree that the whole country will strike forever. So, and they had no means, you know, and they agreed. So practically, for one and a half a year, there was double power in Poland. There was the Solidarność, which was a very effective power machine, that, and there was the, the system. So I visited Poland, and then I learned there how to print. That was basic thing. That, we had to know the technique, the most sim the simplest technique. Maybe I can show you here something about that. It's not that. Yeah, here. This is a manuscript. And this is a technique, very simple one. We call it Ramka, it's framed. That means that if there would be a picture, there is one. There are two pictures. With that, I, am, I can print the book. And we, what we need it is only a screen to put it at the, on the back side and to put a stencil paper on it and with one, one move we produced one page. It was relatively effective. Many, many people have done it. So we started with this technique. But naturally later on we have used uh, better techniques as well because uh, the, some friends of our they managed to, uh, to uh, cross it through the border. There is our duplicator, for instance. The first one, it served for 10 years. And uh, we produced two, 300 tons of books in a year. And then something happened. 
In 1983, on the 23rd of September, a police car was coming after me. And it went all since three days already that they always stopped me and they took away the manuscripts and everything that was in the car. And they were no more, not trained police policemen, but they were from the street. They were ordered to do that. And I was already fed up with it. So it's uh, that we cannot work. And in my, in my car, there was a letter to my friend, uh, George Conrad, he's a famous Hungarian writer, and there was also a translation. I translated Andrei Saharov's writing about the Cold War and uh, about what to do in that situation. I translated it from German, my German is not so good, so it took me a week, and it was handwritten. And the one policeman started to read it to the other that freedom of conscience, okay, we arrest him. And then he started to read the letter. And I told him, you have no authorization to read letters. Only the persecutor can give you that, and you don't have it. It's illegal what you are doing. And then I grabbed his arm, and I was stronger. And he was standing there, he, he, he doesn't know that what to do, and, and then he was standing like that, and I told my opinion, and he was more and more pale, and, and uh, okay, now what happened after that, I was beaten, but I was protecting myself, and I was stronger. So it was, yeah, finally, one of them, with the rubber truncheon, uh, uh, hit me on my, uh, uh, on, on my head from the back. So I lost conscience, and then uh, I was, uh, I woke up in the hospital, and that in the next, uh, the, in the next bed nearby, there was a patient, and he was listening BBC, and I was the, in the news and the first one. So and then I thought, okay, I became a politician. Uh, and uh, it's a, you know, it's an interesting thing that the worse was the better for us. So if they made, made us world famous uh, because of that. And, and because uh, Hungary at that time in the 80s already depended very much on loans, they could run the economy only with IMF and World Bank loans. And which country is practically dominating these two institutions? The United States. And on the day of my trial, because I was accused that I had beaten two policemen, was not right, to half of the truth. And uh, uh, then on the day of my trial, Ronald Reagan pronounced a statement uh, that the United States of America wants a fair trial and verdict in the case of Gabodensky. And, you know, it, it was a message. So finally they suspended it for three years. And I had known in that three years that they do not want to arrest me and to, to, to imprison me because, you know, it would ha have a very high cost. So they were rational in a way and they haven't done it. And we started to produce double more and double more and more and more and more and more literature. So we were competing already with the official literature. We, everywhere you have seen our publications. And there was a Radio Free Europe, which was also uh, uh, an institution financed by the United States. It was in Munich, and from Munich it was transmitting uh, to all the East European countries in, uh, in their own language. And we were every day in the news. So uh, they were reading the articles, they were in the news, uh, <laughs> they told what happened with us and so on. So we were practically, we were uh, in the focus of the radio. And in 1990, when the system collapsed and the system change started and we were preparing ourselves for the, for the change, 
Then I gave a lot of, lot of, lot of lectures everywhere in the countryside to people, and I, there were two. The, I categorized the audience into two groups: those who listen to Radio Free Europe and have known who we are and what we demand and what we are for, and those who not. And I had to explain the situation much more to those who they did not follow. Oh, excuse me. Some of the kids have to go. But okay, you know. and then uh, the question is whether you have questions. So, yeah. I am yeah, able to answer your questions if you have any. Oh. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we just did a lesson on basically Soviet propaganda, and the kids have been really fascinated by it, right? Um, and really kind of curious about, like, mm -hmm. did people, it, some of these questions for me are very hard to answer, right? Because I'm like, wasn't alive at the time. I didn't live in the, in the Soviet Union. So their question is kind of like, what was the people's consciousness of this propaganda that would be released about Stalin, right? That like kind of presented him, of course, as something that he wasn't, but as this like, idealistic, altruistic, you know, child-friendly, intelligent person, um, which he was none of the above, but the kids are very curious about like how, how many people kind of believed that and how many people accepted it because they felt like if they didn't, something bad would happen to them. And that's very difficult sometimes to answer uh, as a teacher. Yeah. But imagine a, a situation when all the media is in exactly. the hands of the Communist and Party. That's what I explained. I was like, that, this is that, the only that, access. Basically, that is the yes. explanation. And, yeah. But in, in Russia, there, from the very beginning, there were already uh, groups which were not well organized and which were underground, mm -hmm. but they disseminated information about the counter. system itself. Mm -hmm. And many, many of them, they were sentenced to prison and mm -hmm. they were sent to the Gulag. Mm -hmm. And about the Gulag, there were coming informations in the, in, in the society. Yeah. So there was another source as well, which was very personal, that let's say my father is in Kamchatka, uh, in, a, in the Gulag, mm -hmm. in a camp, and he, he got life sentence or 10 years and, and so on. Many people died there and so on. So there were news about that. Mm -hmm. People. Uh, people could have get information if mm -hmm. they wanted. Mm -hmm. But the problem is uh, more complicated because they didn't want to get this information. Right. For instance, what I told about my family, mm -hmm. about 56, mm -hmm. that my other cousin, mm -hmm. uh, with whom I made an interview much, much later in the 90s, mm -hmm. and whom I did not know even in that old before 1990, yeah. he he was shot in the in his neck and he in, and and his father died there in the in front of the parliament. Mm -hmm. But about that topic, the family was not speaking at all. Mm -hmm. Not even no 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 mm -hmm. no. They I did not know that it uh, this uh, because they were afraid. Yeah. That uh, because you know uh, in the communist sense there were a lot of lot of instruments. For instance, mm -hmm. they owned all the factories, all the agriculture, everything. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was against the system, could have lose his job, right. and he could not get another one. Yeah, yeah. So there's easy. so much on the that's, line. That's very, yeah. in, in my family, my father, uh, uh, he, he lost his job in Berlin as a diplomat, mm -hmm. and afterwards, it, for him, it was very easy to, uh, difficult to survive, he, he he had to work because he spoke five languages for a factory to sell tracks, mm -hmm. uh, and it was far away from the center of the city. So every day he had to 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 drive uh, three four hours mm -hmm. just because of that, and he was ba very badly paid. And not, now what is interesting, uh, what happened later with him? My mother became the member of the Communist Party, and she mm -hmm. was working in a Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. And because of her, and because of, of, of uh, their friends, finally, after, let's say, 10 years, uh, he got a job 
and he be, he 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 was he started to sell factories, mm -hmm. so food factories mm -hmm. in Russia, Soviet Union, in and also in the so so called uh, 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 underdeveloped part of the world to to the Arabic countries and elsewhere. So he he was then in the right place and. Uh, uh, the problem was solved, but they never, they were never speaking about, uh, about mm -hmm. 56. So. Mm -hmm. I think this is typical, that yeah. even those, because hundreds of thousands of people participated in the revolution and right. were fighting with, 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 with guns against the, uh, the, uh, the Soviet army, yeah. the Red Army. Red army. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the explanation, that yeah. the information, non-official information came they came mostly, I think, from the Gulag. Mm -hmm. That this and that man was imprisoned and uh, mm -hmm. this and that or died and so on. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, I hope that the talk today made a lot of this um, just... Real. Yeah. An impression about yeah, it. Yeah, just been trying to really help the kids kind of see and understand what that might be like, um, and that there are some of those similarities between right fascism and communism and, and these other instances where communist dictators try to make that appeal of it's gonna be so much better and everyone will be treated this way, and in, in reality, it's like this, it's, it's the there same or sometimes yeah. even worse, yeah. right, um, than, than the dictator that doesn't pretend to do that, right? And the dictator that just says, you have no rights and I'm a dictator, it's extremely similar, so. I, I give an idea, maybe it can explain a lot to mm -hmm. the children as well. It's a little bit complicated, but in 1956, uh, Khrushchev changed the policy. Mm -hmm. Because un until that time, so between 1917 and 1956, uh, they did not admit that there is a competition in economy between the two systems, mm -hmm. the liberal democracy and uh, the Soviet system. Mm -hmm. But he then promised that we shall overcome and we shall produce more goods and better goods and you will have a, a better standard of living. Mm -hmm. And a competition started and they promised, let's say, that within eight years the standard of living will, will be higher than the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake, mm -hmm. because until there wasn't a competition, but because they thought it's a different quality. Mm -hmm. We cannot compare ourselves because we have our utopia, everybody is mm -hmm. equal and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they started to compare the two, mm -hmm. then the people started to compare the two, right. and they, ha they have seen the differences. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, I, I, I grew up already in that system that mm -hmm. we compared ourselves with, right. the, with the so-called West, right. with liberal democracy, mm -hmm. the yeah. market system. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much again for coming. Yeah, I'm glad one of the students that was sitting up in this row, um, he's so bright, but we, were, we talked about like, what, is, what are these definitions of e extreme left, extreme right? And he was like, I feel like it's maybe a circle. <laughs> he, so we talked about, you know, what does it mean to yes, be extreme yes, yes. right and extreme yes. left? And then he said, well, maybe they should just draw it as a circle yeah. instead of a line. And I said, yeah, yeah. you're absolutely exactly. right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So he, he Lot made... Lot of similarities. Exactly. So it was, it was... I'm so glad that they came because he was one of the kids that made that point. At least 40. Yes. We had, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We had a great... And slides because you can show... I would love to. Maybe yes. Gabor can explain the KGB ones. Mm -hmm. and, um... Yeah. Yeah, and there's a tie to current day Ukraine. The yeah, absolutely. And, and him in Hungary, not. I mean. Now we, you know, what we can do. Up, up, this crazy system that we have now is an autocracy. Mm -hmm. It is pro-Russia, mm -hmm. and there is a propaganda, and half of the society believe in it. Yeah. That the Ukrainians are responsible for the war. Crazy, yeah. Right? That's a, yeah. Uh, but what we could, could have done up till now, that we have the refugees, mm -hmm. we means civil organizations, mm -hmm. and also uh, two weeks ago uh, we have been in Ukraine, we brought there a generator to produce uh, electric energy mm -hmm. uh, for a part of the city. So you it were is, there last 
two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, it, and it is functioning, yes. Mm -hmm. So it is a very effective way to help. Yeah. So we are able to help, but you know, there is the system which is pro-Russia and there are people who, who do not know what to do. Right. We, it's a, we, we receive, for instance, I am uh, teaching in a high school and uh, there, it's interesting what happened, that uh, there, there was a, a, a nice room like this. Mm -hmm. Not so beautiful, but huge. <laughs> uh, the absolutely the protocol room. Yeah. And we uh, allowed about 50 Ukraine refugees there to stay. Mm -hmm. And they stayed there for four months. But practically, they were not Ukrainians, but they were Hungarians mm -hmm. from the Karpatsko, Pat Karpatsko region, which yeah. is Hungarian, the, the, the western part of, mm -hmm. little part of, of, uh, of uh, Ukraine, mm -hmm. where the Hungarians are in majority. Yeah. And they were not even Hungarian, they were Roma, they were gypsies. Mm -hmm. And they were not uh, 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 refugees in a political sense or anything, mm -hmm. but they simply wanted to survive and to right. get food and place where to live. Mm -hmm. So after a couple of months, uh, the director of the dean of the high school had to decide that you have to leave that because you know it's, we can't help you. But this war is like that. that yeah. you, you never know that somebody is coming out from a country because he, is, he has to mm -hmm. or, or simply because he is poor and he wants to get rid of everything and to, to live mm -hmm. in a, other country. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. But anyway, we have 40 poor Roma. Yeah. For a couple of months. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. I wish we have a. St we have two students who immigrated here from Germany. Um, they're Romanian, and then their families immigrated. So they're Romanian, but immigrated to Germany, and then now to here. But in U.S. history last year, he would always talk about having grown up in um, West Berlin, mm -hmm. but then how their families traveled all over Germany. So it was really interesting to have him in the room and be able to even share like the differences just physically. Yes. This is what, yes. this is the differences between Eastern and Western Germany that, and that modern That is the, day. the largest contrast. Yeah, yeah. East, East Berlin and West and Berlin. Yes, yes, yeah, so he was, it was really nice kind of having him in the room to, to help the other kids kind of envision that and see it. Mm -hmm. but, Thank you again so much for coming. Thank you. Um, and for the work that you're doing now. Yeah, of course. We are here only for 10 days because of my grandchild. Yeah. With my girlfriend, I'm here and uh, visiting my daughter. Oh, that's wonderful. Who is teaching in, uh, in, in Stanford. Oh, that's amazing. In the university. Yeah. She's a linguist. Oh, okay. That's in wonderful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>